This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Watcher by Robert H. Benson. One morning the priest and I went out soon after breakfast and walked up and down a grass path between two yew hedges. The dew was not yet off the grass that lay in shadow, and thin patches of gossamer still hung like torn cambric on the yew shoots on either side. As we passed for the second time up the path, the old man suddenly stooped, and pushing aside a dock-leaf at the foot of the hedge, lifted a dead mouse, and looked at it as it lay stiffly on the palm of his hand. I saw that his eyes filled slowly with the ready tears of old age. "'He has chosen his own resting-place,' he said. "'Let him lie there. Why did I disturb him?' And he lay him gently down again, and then, gathering a fragment of wet earth, he sprinkled it over the mouse. "'Earth to earth, ashes to ashes,' he said, in sure and certain hope. And then he stopped, and, straightening himself, with difficulty, walked on, and I followed him. "'You once expressed an interest,' he said, "'in my tales of the visions of nature I have seen. Shall I tell you how once I saw a very different sight? I was eighteen years old at the time, that terrible age when the soul seems to have dwindled to a spark overlaid by a mountain of ashes.' when blood and fire and death and loud noises seem the only things of interest, and all tender things shrink back and hide from the dreadful noonday of manhood. Someone gave me one of those shot pistols that you may have seen, and I loved the sense of power that it gave me, for I had never had a gun. For a week or two in the summer holidays I was content with shooting at a mark, or at the level surface of water and delighted to see the cardboard shattered, or the quiet pool torn to shreds along its mirror, where the sky and green lay sleeping. Then that ceased to interest me, and I longed to see a living thing suddenly stop living at my will. Now, and he held up a deprecating hand, I think sport is necessary for some natures. After all, the killing of creatures is necessary for man's food. And sport, as you will tell me, is a survival of man's delight in obtaining food, and it requires certain noble qualities of endurance and skill. I know all that, and I know further, that for some natures it is a relief, an escape for humours that will otherwise find an evil outlet. But I do know this, that for me it was not necessary. However, there was every excuse, and I went out in good faith one summer evening, intending to shoot some rabbits as they ran to cover from the open field. I walked along the inside of a fence with a wood above me and on my left, and the green meadow on my right. Well, owing probably to my own lack of skill, though I could hear the patter and rush of the rabbits all round me, and could see them in the distance, sitting up listening with cocked ears, as I stole along the fence, I could not get close enough to fire at them with any hope of what I fancied was success and by the time that I had arrived at the end of the wood, I was in an impatient mood. I stood for a moment or two leaning on the fence, looking out of that pleasant coolness into the open meadow beyond. The sun had at that moment dipped behind the hill before me, and all was in shadow, except where there hung a glory about the topmost leaves of a beech that still caught the sun. The birds were beginning to come in from the fields, and was settling one by one in the wood behind me, staying here and there to sing one last line of melody. I could hear the quiet rush and the sudden clap of a pigeon's wings as he came home, and as I listened I heard, pealing out above all other sounds, the long liquid song of a thrush somewhere above me. I looked up idly and tried to see the bird and after a moment or two caught sight of him as the leaves of the beach parted in the breeze. His head lifted, 
and his whole body vibrating with the joy of life and music. As someone has said, his body was one beating heart. The last radiance of the sun over the hill reached him, and bathed him in golden warmth. Then the leaves closed again as the breeze dropped, but still his song rang out. Then there came on me a blinding desire to kill him. All the other creatures had mocked me and run home. Here at least was a victim, and I would pour out the sullen anger that had been gathering during my walk, and at least demand this one life as a substitute. Side by side with this I remembered clearly that I had come out to kill for food. That was my one justification. Side by side I saw both these things, and I had no excuse, no excuse. I turned my head every way, and moved a step or two back to catch sight of him again, and, although this may sound fantastic and overwrought, in my whole being was a struggle between light and darkness. Every fibre of my life told me that the thrush had a right to live. Ah, he had earned it, if labour were wanting, by this very song that was guiding death towards him. But black, sullen anger had thrown my conscience and was now struggling to hold it down till the shot had been fired. Still I waited for the breeze, and then it came, cool and sweet-smelling like the breath of a garden, and the leaves parted. Then he sang in the sunshine, and in a moment I lifted the pistol and drew the trigger. With the crack of the cap came silence overhead, and after what seemed an interminable moment came the soft rush of something falling, and the faint thud among last year's leaves. Then I stood, half terrified, and stared among the dead leaves. All seemed dim and misty. My eyes were still a little dazzled by the bright background of sunlit air and rosy clouds, on which I had looked with such intensity, and the space between the branches was a world of shadows. Still I looked a few yards away, trying to make out the body of the thrush, and fearing to hear a struggle of beating wings among the dry leaves. And then I lifted my eyes a little, vaguely. A yard or two beyond where the thrush lay was a rhododendron bush. The blossoms had fallen, and the outline of dark, heavy leaves was unrelieved by the slightest touch of colour. As I looked at it, I saw a face looking down from the higher branches. It was a perfectly hairless head and face, the thin lips were parted in a wide smile of laughter. There were innumerable lines about the corners of the mouth, and the eyes were surrounded by creases of merriment. What was perhaps most terrible about it all was that the eyes were not looking at me, but down among the leaves. The heavy eyelids lay drooping, and the long, narrow, shining slits showed how the eyes laughed beneath them. The forehead sloped quickly back like a cat's head, the face was the colour of earth, and the outlines of the head faded below the ears and chin into the gloom of the dark bush. There was no throat, or body or limbs, so far as I could see. The face just hung there like a downturned eastern mask in an old curiosity shop, and it smiled with sheer delight, not at me, but at the thrush's body. There was no change of expression so long as I watched it, just a silent smile of pleasure petrified on the face. I could not move my eyes from it. After what I suppose was a minute or so, the face had gone. I did not see it go, but I became aware that I was looking only at leaves. No, there was no outline of leaf or play of shadows that could possibly have been taken for form of a face. You can guess how I tried to force myself to believe that that was all, how I turned my head this way and that, to catch it again but there was no hint of a face. Now I cannot tell you how I did it, but although I was half beside myself with fright, I went forward towards the bush and searched furiously among the leaves for the body of the thrush, and at last I found it, and lifted it. It was still limp and warm to the touch. Its breast was a little ruffled, and one tiny drop of blood lay at the root of the beak below the eyes, like a tear of dismay and sorrow at such an unmerited, unexpected death. I carried it to the fence and climbed over, and then began to run in great steps, looking now and then awfully at the gathering gloom of the wood behind, 
where the laughing face had mocked the dead. I think, looking back as I do now, that my chief instinct was that I could not leave the thrush there to be laughed at, and that I must get it out into the clean, airy meadow. When I reached the middle of the meadow, I came to a pond which never quite ran dry, even in the hottest summer. On the bank I laid the thrush down, and then, deliberately, but with all my force, dashed the pistol into the water, then emptied my pockets of the cartridges, and threw them in, too. Then I turned again to the piteous little body, feeling that at least I had tried to make amends. There was an old rabbit hole near, the grass growing down in its mouth, and a tangle of web and dead leaves behind. I scooped a little space out among the leaves, and then laid the thrush there, gathered a little of the sandy soil and poured it upon the body, saying, I remember, half unconsciously, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, in sure and certain hope. And then I stopped, feeling that I had been a little profane, though I do not think so now. And then I went home. As I dressed for dinner, looking out over the darkening meadow where the thrush lay, I remember feeling happy that no evil thing could mock the defenceless dead out there in the clean meadow where the wind blew and the stars shone down. End of The Watcher by Robert H. Benson